Uh, this evening's reading is Romans 12, uh, verses 3 to 8. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us, each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophecy, prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. This is the word of the Lord. Good evening and thank you very much for coming out this evening to Holy Trinity Church. I'm Lats Blaylock and I'm an occasional preacher here. And I want to talk to you this evening about two things. Um, it sounds a bit bleak as a starting point, but in some ways this sermon is about loneliness and purposelessness. So if you're feeling lonely or purposeless, you're in the right place. Actually, I don't think there's one of us in church this evening who doesn't experience loneliness. The human yearning for community is built in strong in all our hearts and minds. And for all of us, sometimes that aches. Even in the best bits of life, it's no fun without someone to share it with. And the new parent rejoicing at their beautiful baby, well, they can still be lonely uh, in the middle of the night. And the old parent who's missing their youngster who's gone away to university, age 18 or 19, for the first time. Those parents cry real tears. And so do the new university students, actually, who have rocked themselves up uh, in Leicester for the first time, something they've long hoped for and looked forward to. But suddenly, the room seems a little more like a rabbit hutch than you had hoped that it would. And you feel rather alone. And the person who wanted to be a parent, but never had that joy. That's a sharp loneliness, that one is. And the older people who think that all the ones they love have gone on ahead and they miss them. That's the loneliness of being human. And we all get it. And there's not one of us either in church this evening who has not yearned for a, a sense of purpose uh, to bring a little more meaning to their lives. Uh, some days... It all seems so pointless, doesn't it? It all seems like the wasted time of dust, the sand of destiny drizzling through the egg timer of eternity, and you just sit there and watch it and wish it all meant something. I wonder if, like me, you sometimes think that the achievements and goals that you set yourself leave you questioning, is that really the best that I could do? And it all seems a bit of a bad day turning to dust kind of thing. Some people say, I don't know what you think about this, but some people say we face a special crisis of loneliness and a crisis of lack of meaning and purpose in the 21st century world. Well, I know what they mean and I know why people say that, but I actually think that's a permanent feature of the human condition. Uh, always loneliness, always a lack of purpose in human life. And you know, that's one of the things I love about being a Christian that uh, in these verses, these Bible verses that we've read tonight, and that I've left up on screen for you just to notice, in these verses, I believe that St. Paul tells us about being in the body of Christ and about the gifts that the Holy Spirit of God gives to every individual within the church. And you get a little sniff from that of St. Paul's offer, the Holy Spirit's offer to us to ease our loneliness and to reassure us of the purposes of our lives. Church, not perfect, but here we are this evening, hopeful that God in our community will ease 
our loneliness. Our scriptures assure us that God has purposes for each one of us. And God gives gifts to each one of us by the Spirit, gifts for everybody. Now, these verses from Romans, you, you could have read a similar list, in fact, in, um, in two other Bible books, in two other New Testament books. And I don't know about you, but for me, the phrase gift list conjures up what you see when someone invites you to a wedding. And there's a gift list lodged for you on the John Lewis website. And you can go there and purchase whatever you would like to for your uh, marrying couple who are your friends. But, you know, the gifts that God promises to Christian people, the gift that God has got for you, every single one of you, the gift that God has got for you, it's not like a John Lewis gift list. In fact, it's the opposite. Because those gifts, we would give them to somebody for them, wouldn't we? But the gift that God gives to you, he gives to you for other people. The gifts of God, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, Paul's chosen metaphor for our community he says, do the thing that God gives to you in your community and do it diligently and do it working hard and do it with faith and generosity. And it's not for you. It's for everybody else in the room, everybody else in the community. And that's interesting, isn't it? That Paul's chosen metaphor for our community is a body. Uh, he could have chosen different metaphors. There were plenty hanging around. He could have chosen like a metaphysical, a, meta, a mechanistic metaphor but he doesn't say the church is like a well-oiled machine. If you take part in a church for any length of time, you will quickly find out that it is not a particularly well-oiled machine. It's a body. And he doesn't compare the church to a Colosseum, the astonishing buildings of the Romans to whom he's writing here, because I guess he knew that they were built on the backs of the suffering of tens of thousands of slaves. Those comparisons were available, but he doesn't say the church is like a machine, the church is like a building. He says instead the church is like a body. It is the body of Christ. It's an organic, shared, holistic life together. And when the body hurts in one part, we all suffer. <laughs> and when we work together in harmony, it is amazingly good, like the pleasures of the body when it's all working well. Here's a reason I love being a Christian, because God never asked me to follow Jesus on my own, but always in the company of a magnificent host of other Christian people. You lot. Yes, you are a magnificent host of brothers and sisters. And that stretches back 20 centuries and all over the world, among billions of humans, the body of Christ, says Paul, and individually members of it, we are each given by the Spirit high-value gifts to contribute to the community. God doesn't give you a John Lewis air fryer. God doesn't give you a posh set of pillowcases and duvet covers. God's vision is way bigger than that. The purpose of God in your life is that you should be in a community, in a body, where the thing that you bring is the thing that only you, in all your beautiful humanity, you can bring. And notice that God's purpose for you may be taking an inch step forward just tonight, just as you sit and think and pray and worship in this particular bit of the body of Jesus Christ. And next, would you notice that Paul's teaching here is actually really radical because it rejects putting anyone on a pedestal. Have a look at a pedestal here. What's a pedestal? It looks like this. Next slide will show you. The Romans kind of invented these, and we still have them in our architecture, don't we? That's a pedestal, and it's for putting something on top of it that is more important than all the other things that aren't on top of pedestals. <laughs> but, but Paul's vision of what it means to be a Christian community, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the Bible says... The Christians are going to be a community without pedestals. There is, this is honestly, this is extraordinary. This is the flattening of hierarchy. It's the way of following Jesus that was preached against giving more honor to priests than to a person with leprosy, to the most contemptuously held slave. Jesus says, and Paul repeats, love without distinction. No one's on a pedestal here. It, it, you can see this in loads of bits of the gospel narrative and in loads of bits of the history of the early church. The, the Pentecost miracle where 3,000 people became Christians on the first birthday of the church, that was actually a miracle because everyone heard the gospel of God in their own common language. It's a demotic miracle. It's right down there for, on the grassroots. 
And the early Christian communities, can you picture them? They were so tiny and so vulnerable as they sprang up in city after city across the Middle East, across the Roman world of its day. Those early Christian communities did not look like the religions of the day because the religions of the day were incredibly hierarchical. Scribes and Pharisees and priests and Levites set themselves on the top of heaps of other human beings and they demanded status and loyalty and obedience and money. But Jesus and St. Paul following Jesus taught the Christians a radical claim. Every one of us is part of one body. Every one of us has an essential gift. No one of us matters more than the rest to God and no one of us should matter more than the rest to the, holy, to the community of Christ. The spirit is most at work where humility is found, not where pride is seen. That's why in the first verse that we read, Paul calls on us to have a sober judgment. Don't go around thinking of yourself as bigger than you really are and better than you really are. That's interesting, isn't it? Sober judgment, he says. It is sometimes when people are a bit drunk, isn't it? They think they're absolutely God's gift to the entire universe. Think of yourself soberly, says St. Paul. Don't, don't give yourself airs and graces. No pedestals for the Christians. And would you notice next, please, that um, uh, this new community of Jesus, it swept across the world, and it swept across the world particularly being attractive to those at the low base of any society in which the Christian gospel was found. I don't know if you've seen this phrase, but they said when the Christians first came to Thessaloniki, they said, these people have turned the world upside down. Uh, this is a quote. When Paul came to Thessaloniki, they dragged the believers in Jesus before the authorities and said, these people have upended the world, turning everything upside down. And now they've come here too. But they weren't really pleased about that. That wasn't like a welcome to Thessaloniki. They didn't like it. Because so many societies, that's actually a picture of uh, Egyptian society. Pharaoh at the top and viziers and high priests and royal overseers and district governors and scribes and artisans and farmers and laborers. And guess where you are in all of that? Down the bottom. The Christian communities of the first century, the way of Jesus, they made a radical claim. Everyone's part of one body and everyone's got an essential gift. No one of us matters more than the rest. And that language of upending the whole world, inverting everything, it's in the Bible to stretch your imagination and to make you see the impact of the message of Jesus in the viciously hierarchical and cruel world of Rome with its emperor and senators and centurions and slaves and crucifixions. Jesus' community was so attractive in that first century because the new community said everyone matters and everyone's got a gift. And Paul's emphasis there is on less loneliness, more purpose in your life. And I think this, I think that what was true then in the first century is true today too. Paul emphasizes, yeah, to them back then, but to us here now too, that the gifts of God by the Spirit to the church are not for selfish use, they are for each other. And they are for the world beyond the church door because the church is supposed to be a unique kind of society really it exists for the benefit of non-members not for the benefit of members or not so much this body of Christ here at Holy Trinity in Leicester it doesn't exist just for the people who come here it at least at least 50 percent it exists for people who've not been in yet or for people who've just come in this evening for the first time the church is the opposite of some kind of exclusive golf club or some sort of expensive dining society where hardly anyone can get in and once you're in, you pull up the drawbridge. Instead, the body of Jesus Christ on earth commands us, us who claim to follow Jesus Christ, to give our gifts out of love for Jesus to everyone who needs them. And this is, you know, this is why we run services here, because we want people to hear that this is a place of less loneliness and more purpose in life. We have got the good news of our Saviour Jesus, and we want to share it. And if you have come this evening and you think, what does he mean, the good news of Jesus? How does he share that? Please, don't go tonight without speaking to somebody 
and discovering a little more about what that good news might be. I'll sit outside, I'll stand outside myself, talk to me if you've got no one else to talk to about that. Don't leave without talking to someone about how you become a follower of Jesus, a part of the body of Christ. This, this could be a day of decision for you. Don't leave without doing that. Now, the specific gifts that Paul names and mentions. On this slide, I've made a list of the ones that are mentioned in Ephesians chapter 4 and the longer list that comes in 1 Corinthians 12 and then the list we've read this evening, which has eight gifts on it. We read seven and there's one more mentioned in verse 13, a few verses after the end of the reading that we had tonight. And that first list from Ephesians, Paul is writing about, um, he's writing about Christian leadership there, and he writes particularly about gifts of Christian leadership. And in 1 Corinthians 12, he's writing to the church in Corinth, which we might say was, some, I don't know, some, somewhat dysfunctional. And he's got all sorts of things to straighten out and sort out. And he writes to them about uh, the, the gift of prophecy and the gift of speaking in tongues and the gift of the interpretation of tongues, uh, which look kind of quite spectacular gifts. But he also writes to them about administration and guidance and the gift of helping other people. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit. And then when it comes to Romans, then this list, list I think, is, it's interesting, isn't it? It's slightly different. And if you put them all together and add them all up, then I still don't think that um, you've got the whole lot of gifts that God gives to the people of God in the church. For instance, there's no mention here of those who are gifted to make music and lead us in worship. No mention of our IT crowd, who we depend upon so much in our worship together. So I don't think you should just read those lists of gifts and say, that's the lot. Those are all the gifts that God ever gave to the church. I think there's more. And I suggest that you put them all together and then think, what other gifts is God giving to the church today? Because God gives to the church, I believe this, in every age, everything that the Christian community needs. Second, I'd suggest gifts are nothing if they're kept wrapped up in parcels. Gifts are open, uh, gifts, gifts that are open to some use. And if God has given you a gift, and even if you're hesitant about it at the moment and you think, I'm not sure where I'm going with this, or has God given me a gift, I'm not sure I even know what it is, then get to doing the unwrapping as quickly as you can. And if you don't know what your gift from God to the church is just yet, then there's something else you should do because you're here tonight listening into this sermon. You should talk to somebody uh, one of your most trusted Christian sisters and brothers, a good friend, talk to a good friend, because they'll know you well, and they'll know what you're good at. And ask them, what do you think God's gift to me might be for the Christian community? If you do that because you're here tonight, you must expect your life to change a little bit, because God will not want you to hold on to your gift and look at it and think it's marvelous. God will want you to put it in to the service of the community. And third, uh, this was in my heart to say this in the sermon this evening, and then I came across a quotation that said it much better than I could have managed. Third, gifts are not for us alone. They're always for the community. Listen to this, written by Dr. John Stott, who is a great Christian minister. Uh, he, he's dead now, but uh, his influence on this church is interesting because one of his curates became a vicar here uh, in the 1980s, uh, Reverend John Aldis. And John Stott wrote this when he was 88 years old. He said, I sometimes hear old people say, I don't want to be a burden to anyone else. I'm only happy to carry on living as long as I can look after myself. But as soon as I become a burden, I would rather die. John Stott, this is wrong. We are all designed to be a burden to others. You're designed to be a burden to me. And I'm designed to be a burden to you. And the life of the family, including the life of the local church family, should be one of mutual burdensomeness. Carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fill, fulfill the law of Christ. I'm going to work on that myself this week. I'm going to try and be a burden to people a little <laughs> bit more. Actually, you can forget the rest of what I say tonight, if you like. Think about that from John Stott. That is close to the heart of what St. Paul is teaching, that we are to be a mutuality. We are to be a hospitable community. We are to be a body. You're not a Christian on your own. It's not an individualistic thing to be a Christian. 
Fourth, about the lists, our Romans list today mentions generosity, service, encouragement, mercy, hospitality. I love the fact that I've been part of this church for nearly 35 years, and every time I come here, I see people practicing those gifts. Every time someone here at Holy Trinity shares a wise idea in a conversation, or cooks a meal for somebody else, or provides coffee and pizza for the congregation, every time somebody stands up and leads the music group, somebody sings to lead us all in worship, every time somebody makes the sound desk work, or rearranges the furniture for the next thing that's coming up this week, every time... Those are practical, purposeful gifts. Even if sometimes they're almost invisible, they're what the church needs now. And they may be what God calls you in your gifts to give the church. I'm going to finish with this. This is a work of art by Kelly Lattimore. And she's a Christian from Birmingham. And she paints icons. And if you have a little look down the list there, you may be able to spot, as I could, an icon of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a great saint. You may be able to spot an icon of Mother Teresa. You may be able to spot an icon of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. But you'll be loads of people on the the square there who you'll look at them and say, well, there seems to be an icon of a saint in trainers, a saint in a tracky top. There's an icon of an everyday saint. There's an icon of a saint from the backyard. And you know this, I reckon that uh, uh, Katie La- Kelly Lattimore has got that about right because she is teaching through the very art that she's made and that's her gift in action. She is teaching that if you receive a gift from God and you give it back to the human community, then you can be one of the backyard saints of God. You can be one of the saints of Holy Trinity, all of you, all of us. I believe that this all flows from the gospel that we preach here in this church. It's a simple gospel in so many ways. Come to Jesus. You might be lonely. You have days of aimlessness. But if you come to Jesus, God God will generously bring you into the body of Christ. And God will give you a gift to share for the whole community. I don't mean that you'll never feel lonely again. I don't mean that you will suddenly discover that you have a wholly purpose-driven life and change the world by next Friday. But I do mean this, that in Christ, we have a firm hope that we can travel this life together, sharing our fragile humanity, and we can do it as one body. We can leave nobody out. We can all bring our gifts to share in the common good. So here's the message this evening. For less loneliness and for more purpose in your life, let's be the people that St. Paul talks about. Let's give thanks to the God, to God for the gift he's given us. And let's put the gifts into service. I think this is happening already in this community, but I pray and hope and believe that it can happen more. Be generous, show mercy, practice hospitality, serve, encourage, help, give generously. That's the way that God will make us even more the community of Jesus Christ. Amen.